Today is Tuesday, January 16th, 2024, and you're listening to the Ask a Christian podcast. I'm your host, Nate. All right, let's get to it. Uh, we dive back into eternal generation. Um, we get into that. We started to yesterday. It went awry, if you've heard. <laughs> that would have been entertaining. So we actually talk about it and really flesh it out, what it is, what it isn't. Then we talk about the two powers in heaven, if you've ever heard of that one. Then consubstantiality. Then we talk about Jacob and the angel. Um, why was it that the angel was overcome and had to do something to to get out of the situation? Um, had to or wanted to or... Anyway, we talk about that. And then everyone starts fighting. <laughs> oh, the end must be truly nigh. Because, like, all, all the Christians are just, like, getting their hackles up. Everyone's, like, fighting. Everyone's getting grumpy. Like, I don't know. Maybe it's too much togetherness. But that that's not the case. It hasn't been that to together. Anyway, man, I don't know. Like, people are having zero chill. E even I get a little angsty today. Um, so, so I guess may maybe I'll read my own book. So you can check out the Ask a Christian book on Amazon. How to Have Civil Discussions with People Who Are Not Always So Civil. And also, it's a good discipleship book if you have questions about Christianity with a reasonably open mind. Um and you want to know what Christians actually think about stuff instead of telling them what they think about stuff um, or what you think they think about stuff. Um, so check that out. You can also check out the Ask a Christian store, grab a t-shirt or whatever, support this podcast where we try to share the gospel with people on the internet with love and respect and answer questions about what Christianity actually is and what we actually believe being as biblically accurate as possible. So have an awesome day and we will see you later. Share these links. Bye. Okay, so as you called <laughs> yesterday, um, <laughs> so Hebrew roots, we can skip that for now. Um, the big thing was, let's see, the, the things I wanted to hit today are the two powers in heaven, and I think eternal generation is going to be pretty quick and simple. Like, apparently there was a lot of Calvinists uh, arguing in, in, in the room after this one yesterday, and uh, I mean, I guess they're all reformed. So, you know, they're probably all not heretics, I guess. I didn't hear the room, but that's just what I gather. Um, so the question I asked Nick, and he said no, but he kept saying it was a Cal he, he kept saying, trying to tell me what I was asking was not a Calvinist question. And I'm like, bro, I know that. Um, the, wor the key word is tripping you up. Okay, anyways, um, so eternal generation. Would this be like how, how the Bible says, like, you know, the son proceeds from the father. Um, so if you need to proceed, then technically that needs to, to come forth out of something, which is kind of how we say like Jesus was begotten, but not like Joseph beget, you know, Pete who beget James, uh, like not like humans would beget. Cause that means like, you know, having children the normal way people have children. Um, not saying men give birth, but you know what I mean? Like, you know, like the, whatever. Um, but when we talk about God and how Jesus is only, God's only begotten son, that's not like childbirth. That means like to come forth, come with, come from within. Uh, like proceeds so you would think the implication normally speaking is one has to be there for the other to come from because the other can't come from nothing the other has to come from something um as if i'm not confusing enough already that's kind of that's kind of like what i'm, I'm just thinking before we get theological okay so i was asking nick is this similar to how reformed people view salvation or soteriology i guess um in the sense that they would say it all happens, boom, instantaneously. But then if you ask them, it's like, well, no, no. Okay, so technically, one thing has to come just a uh, insy bitsy split second before the other one comes. But it's basically all at the same time. So I was asking, and then you can talk, <laughs> is this kind of how some people see or a gen uh, eternal generation should or should not be seen that the Father always existed, but some minuscule infinitesimal spot in time uh, it was just before jesus um or is that incorrect and it's not how the calvinist sees soteriology there's not something that logically happened one millisecond before um eternal generation even though jesus proceeds from the father um it is 100 percent at the exact same time there is no time difference there are you banging your head against the door yet no, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is so this becomes very complicated. But yes, it is sort of like regeneration preceding faith. How we say that it precedes it logically and not temporally. It doesn't mean that it happens one millisecond before. It means that it happens exactly at this. It, there's no time involved. 
And so the same thing with eternal generation. It's not like the Father existed apart from the Son and Spirit ever in eternity. There was never a, there was never any time by which the Father existed without the Son and the Spirit. There, that's that's just called Arianism. Um, okay, I think I get it. Would this? Are yeah. you saying it's like a stasis? Since you know the common thing is God is outside of time, so it's like a stasis where like you know the Father is is over here wherever here is like time is somewhere different so time is somewhere else god's just over here like like in a stasis I'm not saying god's in stasis but you know like a stasis state and the son like bursts forth or proceeds from the father so if it was in time that's how it would be but since time is subject to god and god is outside of time even though jesus comes from the father um there is no time difference because it's not taking place in time this is taking place like all in a stasis state. Well, no, because it's still like, I mean, that's getting close. It's, we just call it logically prior. So like, you know, eternal generation. And I don't take, I don't know enough about eternal generation. Like this is 10,000 pages of reading to really get into this. Okay. Like, I'm not even kidding. Like it's, it's literally dozens of books to even understand this. So, um, it is simply the, that, that the, the son proceeds from the father logically, but that he has always existed. And how you square that circle, I mean, again, it's 10,000 pages, at least. Is that kind so, of like the Trinity? Like, you know, um, the H2O would be an excellent example if solids, liquid, and gas all existed simultaneously at the exact same time. And they're like, okay, well, if that happened, but try to figure out how to make that happen. So it's like, okay, yeah. well, yes, th this happened. But good luck trying to figure out how. Yeah, it's 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 an extremely complicated doctrine. So, um, and and like people will like go crazy. Like we we literally just so <laughs> so the divide yesterday was between the Thomists and the other Reformed people. And so most Reformed people are not Thomists. We've got our our friends, the college kids, that are all diehard Thomas Aquinas fans. And they're going to see this slightly differently, um, you know. And so most Christians wouldn't even start to even think about eternal generation. It's just not even, you know, it's like not even a thing. There's some logical problems with it. There's like, there's, you know, the problem of aseity. And if the father is the font of aseity, does that mean the son doesn't have aseity? Aseity just means self-sufficient in and of yourself. So does it mean that the individual persons of the Trinity are not ase? Um, that seems to be what monarchical Trinitarianism teaches, or social Trinitarianism, as it's called. So, I mean, there's just like, there's a whole bunch of inside baseball stuff that literally doesn't matter at all, even a little bit, to any Christian outside of a PhD program. And so, like... Um well, I guess one way it would matter is if you mess that up. So, like, the way you could mess that up is if you say, like, you know, I, um, like I compared it to the, um, the Calvin soteriology thing. Like, one happens just no matter how small amount of time, it happens different. So, I guess a way to mess that up that you would care is if someone said, well, no, there was a point where only the Father existed, but, like, the very, very, like, smallest possible amount of time after that, that's when Jesus existed that would be a way to mess that up where people should care, but almost not Correct. because even though, but, but, because even though it's, it's, it would be incorrect if you wrap your head around that. Um, it, it's like almost so, so deep that you're like, surely God's got mercy for that because that's, that, that's very, very deep to think about. Or I don't know, like that's where I'd probably just throw my hands up. Just be like, Hey, repent and believe the gospel. The end is near. So, so the one thing that you cannot say is that the father ever existed without <clears throat> Jesus or the son. If you say and, that, that's called Arianism. That's a that's a heresy. Like that's a going you, to hell type of heresy. And if you don't say that, then there's pretty much no other way to mess that up. Pretty much, yeah. So which like, is which is just know, like we would. Take EG. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, really, like it's like a. <clears throat> you don't have to take EG. It doesn't matter. Yeah, so really, it's like a just an issue of time because if people get into Arianism, normally it's not going to eternal duration. It's just other reasons for Arianism, but eternal generation is basically Arianism just dialed back as far back as you could possibly go to say, well, instead of, you know, 
uh, the Father existing for 100 years before Jesus was made, well, the Father existed 0. 0.00000 millisecond. Nope, still Arianism, technically. Um, so if you don't say that, then I guess you're good. And I, I think some... you're, good. you're not damned. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, but like, you know, the whole thing with eternal generation is that it's such an obscure doctrine that like, again, you, you got to read a bunch of systematic theology to even get a grasp on it. And it, it has more to do with Aristotelian, you know, concepts of God and, and that kind of thing. I'm reading a book right now. Uh, that's excellent, and it's called The Revealed God. Um, and I can put a link for it in the chat. And it goes through a lot of this stuff. It doesn't necessarily go through Eternal Generation, or it might. I don't know. I just started the book. But um, I've read the introduction of the first chapter. But the um, but the book is basically just going to be about doctrine of God. And so what people get all bent, sh bent out of shape about um, is doctrine of God, because if you have a wrong God, that's problematic, right? Like, you know, <laughs> But, like, you know... If, if it's like, oh, I believe in monarchical Trinitarianism, and I'm like, well, I'm not real sure I like that because it's, you know, got some aseity problems. Um, I'm still going to say that's within orthodoxy, and this is what we landed on yesterday. It's like, look, monarchical Trinitarianism and eternal generation is totally fine. It is within the pale of orthodoxy. The problem I have is when the Thomists are like, no, unless you believe in the full Aristotle, then you are damned, like, you know, as if Aristotle was the scripture. So it's like, no, that's not true. Just relax. I don't care if you take Aristotle. That's fine. He had some fine thoughts about things, but that's not the gospel. Like, that's just dumb. I'm almost done making noise. Um, yeah, I, I think that's kind of what we, we landed on yesterday, or we, we tried to. Except the person wouldn't just chill for two seconds. I, I mean, we don't need a name drop because everyone knows who you're talking about. But I mean, the person just had zero chill. And I, I mean, really, it's like you—you you, a dog that's been beaten too many times. It's like now if someone tries to like get close and pet it and like love it and you know take it to the vet, it's like a little chihuahua. It's like all rabbits. Like, ah! and I'm just like, chill, bro. We're trying to help. Like, look, I—I I don't care what's going on in your head. Like, just answer answer some easy questions. Like, you know, tell me you love the devil. I don't, I don't care. I mean, I care. I'll tell you you're wrong, and, you know, you should repent to have eternal life. But, I mean, I'm not going to, like, attack you and, like, jump down your throat. Um, but, but, you know, a couple people tried very hard, um, and it's like they've been attacked so many times for this position um, that they just would not take a breath. And they're like, you're attacking me. You're attacking me. I'm like, well, not for that. I mean, kind of because you won't chill. But I think the bigger problem is, like, the, the two powers in heaven – which I'm I'm vaguely familiar with, like only in the sense that I think it's like something not I don't even know if I can say it's Orthodox Jewish teaching because probably a lot of Jews wouldn't believe that, but I know it I believe it stems from like at least some sect of Judaism where they believe there's like you know God and then like some other type of power like angels or divine counsel or something like that. Like you could basically start at zero because I'm very unfamiliar with the two powers deal. And which one would be more problematic, the eternal generation, which doesn't seem problematic? Um, I mean, there's very small ways to mess that up. But it, it, would you say a two powers issue is more of a problem? If you're using the bathroom right now, I swear. Okay, well, there's a cliffhanger. Okay, so listen to me wash my hands. What? <laughs> what do you say? Okay, well, listen to me wash my hands, and maybe he'll be no, back. No, so, so here's the dealio. So, like, two powers in heaven is just is something that people bring up when they're doing Trinitarian apologetics. It's because in the first century, in, first, in Second Temple Judaism, there was this concept that because throughout the Old Testament we see types and shadows of Christ as well as, you know, Yahweh, um, you know, that there are these two powers in heaven. So the argument goes something like this, that even, even the ancient Jews realized with their monotheistic God that there was this two powers in heaven thing, um, you know, and so this is further proof for the validity of the Trinity. That is the, that's the argument, that's how that goes. It has taken on a much more significance than it should have um, with a lot of people, and, you know, Michael Heiser is a big proponent of this. 
Um, and he's kind of a fringe theologian, and everybody gets upset when I say that, but he is literally a fringe theologian, just like Dr. Bob, like Robert Moray. These are fringe theologians that have gotten a lot of play on YouTube apologetics that literally nobody in the academic space pays any attention to and doesn't even know who they are. They're just simply YouTube famous for being theologians. Um, and, you know... Honestly, like the, the two powers in heaven argument is really weak. Um, you can find a little bit of writing on it, and then rabbis declared it heresy um, around the second century. Um, so there, there's just that. And to say that, the, you know, th this just gives us an idea of progressive revelation. Like, yes, is, is the Trinity, you know, in the Old Testament as far as, you know, there's one God, three persons, and that's the obvious, that's the obvious reality of it. Is that somehow expressed in some of the Old Testament that we can see? Sure, um, we can see types and shadows of it. However, it's not really borne out until the New Testament. So, you know, you really, you really aren't getting to the Trinity without the New Testament. That's the, that's the long and short of it. I don't know. So I, I, I'm driving. What is Nick saying? Because it's probably good. Hey. Nate, did you have an aneurysm? Are you there? Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! I've I've been on mute this entire time. Yeah, dude. Like I was like, what is going on? Why is the room so silent for so oh long? Oh my like, lord! And came back and was like, Are oh, you serious? Yeah, like, no one's how... heard anything for like three minutes, bro. Oh my gosh. Okay. Oh man. Okay. You said what did Nick say, right? And then you didn't hear anything else. That is correct. Good Lord. Come on. Get it together, Nate. Okay. I'm going to try to condense this. Okay. Nick says, oh, goodness. Uh, it wasn't her. She was clearly uh, calmly asking uh, if you meant eternal generation and you didn't know what it was. So, um, and then she talked about procession too. So it turns out I, I got it right. I did know what it was. Um, but I'm, and Steph was also asking, and she kind of took a, it was almost as if the, the spirit of Chris possessed her 
<laughs> and she just went like full Chris mode and started attacking. And stuff's like, look, you're using big words. I just want to know um, how you define that. And I'm like, yeah. And then, you know, Nick was like, well, you don't know what it means. I mean, he tried to chime in, but it, it was really kind of us three. And, well, mostly Steph and her. But um, I'm like, look, by eternal generation, do you mean like Jesus proceeded from the Father just like the scriptures say, like he's begotten? And she kept saying that too, like he's begotten, he's begotten. I'm like, I get that. But when you say eternal generation, and Nick was like, it's an orthodox doctrine, it's fine. I'm like, well, yeah, I can Google eternal generation just like if I say soul sleep. You can Google soul sleep, but there's no guarantee the definition Google gives you of soul sleep is going to be the same thing I mean when I use that term. So I'm, I'm, we're trying to get her to just define what she means. And I'm like, well, is it the thing that Chris said for eternal generation is Jesus was, yes, brought forth, proceeded from the Father, but there was no time delay? Like that's just all – they've always existed all the time? Or when you say eternal generation, do you mean like you know the, the heresy version where there was a time, no matter how small, where the Father ex existed without Jesus? And that's all. I'm like, look. And I gave her both of those examples. I'm like, do you mean either one of those? Can you pick one? It's like, you don't know what it means. Ah! <laughs> and um, anyway, so that's that's what Nick was referring to, um, that she was super calm and amazing and then apparently lost her mind because we're all dumb. <laughs> but I'm like, well, no, you used the term, so it's incumbent on you to just tell us what you mean. And and I'm like, look, there's no gotcha. Like, we're not trying to got do gotcha stuff here. I don't do that. I hate gotcha stuff. Um, I, just tell me one. Like, if you tell me the heresy version, fine. I'll be like, okay, well, I think that's heresy, and, you know, we just disagree. Go about your life. Repent and believe the gospel. But if you tell me the right version, I'll be like, okay, yeah, that's what the Bible says. That sounds fine. So, <laughs> am I on mute again? Nope. I hear you fully. Oh, Jesse's uh, here. He, he heard the whole thing. Oh, yeah, and he had the room afterwards. Oh, and hey, before Steph talks, Steph, <laughs> both of you play nice. Play nice, my children. Uh, someone in someone messaged me and says, oh, yeah, uh, bef before we get this, someone was questioning yesterday, like, uh, why you pronounced <clears throat> heresy upon this person. Um, I think it was because of the Hebrew roots thing, right? It wasn't the eternal generation, and I don't think you were here for the two spirits thing. So it, w it would have been because you thought she, um, she thought she needed to keep the law for salvation and, like, the Hebrew root stuff. Is that... Is that where you came up with the heresy stuff? Which, by the way, she vehemently denies whatever that's yeah. between her and God. I mean, I've talked to her at length for many hours. And she okay, so it's because... With all the oneness, and she's best buds with them and fights against the Trinity constantly. Shout out, Brandon. <laughs> um, but it's because she thinks she needs to keep the law for salvation then. Okay, well, that was... That's not what that she was... says, but that's... No, that's what... what yeah, that's what... You take away that. That's why you said that it wasn't the eternal generation thing or the, the two spirits thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, two, power, two powers in heaven is fine, but if your if your conception of God stops at the two powers in heaven, then you're a heretic. Oh yeah, that was the thing. It was like the um, her her view of the Trinity. I guess she says she she's like I believe a pre eighteen uh, hundreds Turilian view of the Trinity. Um, you know, the, the way they would have believed the Trinity before that. Um, does that give you any insight? So, I mean, it couldn't be two powers, because if she says she believes in some sort of Trinity pre-Turillion, Turillion, whatever, then, I mean, it's, it's got to be three, not two, Turillion. All Turillion all did was coin the term Trinity. Like, everybody, like, from Justin Martyr on down believed in the Trinity. You can see it in the writings. Like, it's just dumb. It's like, she's make, she's attempting to use the obscurity of anti-Nicene church fathers to work in her advantage when the whole this chick's whole deal is that she tries to pass herself off as a Christian when she is not and she knows she is not she's being purposefully deceptive that's that's what I've caught her doing many times okay uh well miss uh <laughs> miss Steph what's up how's it going yeah I mean I didn't like the conversation with her yesterday but I'd have to see a heck of a lot more than I did to agree with Chris on that one but there's that. Anyway, the Bills won last night, so it's a great day. I don't think it bring me is, down today. Is that why you came up here? Yes. To talk to about your house? idolatry? Yeah, we won the wild card game. Everyone eat it! Ha ha ha! Well, you're just going to get beat by the Chiefs eventually, right? Yeah, but not next week. We're going <laughs> to take them. They're coming to us, so 
Everyone get ready. They just played in like zero degrees. I mean, I don't care about this stuff anyway, but they just played in like ne- like minus one degrees against the Dolphins, which is hilarious. They said it was like 80 degrees in Miami when they left Florida. And they got there, it was like negative one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was 12 for the game last night in Buffalo. No, I'm not worried about the weather. I'm more interested in that like Allen's a better quarterback than Mahomes. So that's what's – they did not – the Chiefs did not beat us last year. So was there as much like ice and snow as like the ice bowl like with Green Bay historically? Uh, probably not. I think they got a couple of feet. They got like two or three feet, so not that much. I don't know how much I they had at the ice bowl. Live, I love that you live in such a place of purgatory that two or three feet of snow <laughs> is not that much. Yeah, it's not that bad. Hey, so we had to go there. to school. If we got thirty six inches, we still had to go. Speaking of purgatory, like someone <laughs> sent me a joking message after they were frustrated fighting with the Catholics and said, yeah, sure, that argument was about to convince them they're going to convert to Catholicism and start waving the rainbow flag. I'm like, ha, 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 burn. Well, okay. and now we all know who that is. Wait, do we? Oh. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Steph, do you have any? do you have anything substantive? I think I'm just making up words. Substantial. Yes, this is our year. This is my substantial. The Bills are going to do it. This is our year. I, I meant anything substantial about Jesus to say. Well. Or a <laughs> yeah. Christ-centered conversation or anything like that. I had a question the other day when I was in church, but I forget what it was. Hold on. Let me think. I'll get back to you on something actually decent. All right. Well, in the meantime, Chris, anything else you'd like to say? Because that, that was the purpose of the day to um to wrap up. Two powers in heaven. Uh, so, okay, so like, uh, there is a very small way to mess up eternal generation. Would you also say that th- about the only way to mess up the two powers is if you stop with two powers and don't keep following yeah. two powers to end with the Trinity? Yeah, I mean, does the Spirit have personhood? I mean, the Scripture shows that the Spirit has personhood. The Spirit is a person. I, I just uh, coughed without being muted, didn't I? No, you didn't. Never mind. Oh, oh, um, yeah, and then brother brother asked me to talk about um, consubstantiality. So, um, consubstantial just means that they, the three persons of the Trinity, um, are all of the same substance. They are with each other. So there is no difference in substance between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Substance is. Oh my goodness. Substance is going to be a really like wily term that means a whole bunch of different stuff in different periods of church history. Um, and then you get that with subsistence and the, yeah. So, so yeah, one of the discussions that Jesse and I were having yesterday was like, what are all these ancient ter- early church terms mean? What is the, what are the concepts behind them? Because the words get like blurred. And then there was like even a bunch of disagreement between East and West, between Latin and Greek words. And so that caused a bunch of problems. And so what what part of the discussion yesterday was, was like, what we have to do is parse out what the actual concepts are behind the words that they're using in the early church to find out what they're actually saying. Because as, as we are aware, language changes over time, especially over 2,000 years. And so like the language of the Nicene Creed like Roman Catholics love to to read in the Ro- Holy Roman Catholic Church to the Nicene Creed when it doesn't mean that. It just means the universal church. So in the original Greek it just means the the called out ecclesia like, you know. So I mean yeah, like the one that. global holy app like what whatever what what's the word it's yeah. like one glo- like apostolic. holy global ca- apostolic catholic church. They're like, this is catholic. This is catholic. Wow. Well, it doesn't actually say that. So like, wait, I, I thought mean, I thought it did. I, I thought it said like one one like I I, I thought that I see in Creed. I mean, well, it maybe it's maybe it's a different translation. Holy Apostolic <laughs> Catholic Church. Yeah, that's like, what I'm saying. Yeah, Catholic yes. meaning universal, not Roman yeah. Catholic. Correct. Yeah, that's because what I said. then that would exclude the Eastern Orthodox, who were the ones who came up with the the Nicene Creed in the first place. Like there were very few Westerners that went to Nicaea, so it's just like it's just dumb. I mean, you know. So anyway, so but. That's an example of how people change words over time. And so, 
you know, like, well, the, the discussion that, that Jesse and I were having yesterday that I think was very good was like, what, do, what are the, what do these terms actually mean? What are the concepts they're putting behind them? And before we could really get into that discussion, there was just anathemas and you don't believe in the holy Thomas Aquinas, um, our Lord and Savior. And so because our Lord and Savior Thomas Aquinas is not in your heart, then you are going to hell, essentially. I'm trying to keep a smaller stage, but uh, Jesse demanded he be brought up. So what's up, Jesse? Yeah, I'm trying to find that quote. You remember me um, reading that quote to you guys last week and nobody listened to what I quoted? It was Wait, oh, the, oh, oh, the really, really long one. And then you're done and everyone's sleeping. You're like, did that do anything? I'm like, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's Calvin on the issue of terminology, what Chris was talking about. Ah, uh, right? yes. At this, the heretics raise a hue and cry. Others also, who are not by any means bad men, grumble that the terms essence and hypostasis were devised by man and are nowhere found in Scripture. Since, however, they cannot deny the fact that there are three in one Godhead, are they not being obstinate when they disparage words which convey precisely what Scripture attests? They claim that it would be more useful to confine not only our mind, but also our lips to the limits of Scripture, instead of coming up with foreign words which sow the seeds of quarrels and dissension. For that is how they exhaust them, that is how we exhaust ourselves in verbal brawling, and how our, our bickering we lose truth and destroy love. Nevertheless, if by foreign words they mean all that cannot be found, syllable by syllable in Scripture, they lay a harsh condition on us, since in the process they forbid us for uh, forbid us all preaching where every word is not derived from Scripture. If they regard all foreign words for those that have that have laboriously invented and superstitiously defended giving rise to strife instead of edification, employed needlessly and to no good effect, proving in some way harmful to believers or taking us away from the simplicity of Scripture. I fully endorse my caution, or their caution. My feeling is that in speaking about God, we know we should show the same reverence as we do when we ponder his majesty. For whatever our, we ourselves think about him is mere folly, and anything we might say about him is beside the point. Then he goes on just to say that, you know, using foreign words is not, using okay. foreign words is not um, superfluous or unnecessary. Yes. Just, you know, yes, yes, see what I mean? I, I'm just going to say that oh, the, uh, the Bible says it better in James. It's like, you know. No, it doesn't. The, the, the Bible is the foundation, but it doesn't say it better. <laughs> I'm trying to say, I mean, the grace limit is used up today. <laughs> I'm trying to say the Bible says it better when James says, don't worry, don't worry about like, don't quarrel over words. It's a cancer and ruins all who listen. That's the better, shorter way of saying, uh, don't argue about words. That's what I got from that. Jesse, were you kidding when you said the Bible is the foundation, but doesn't say it better than Calvin? <sighs> yeah, I knew that was going to be. Okay. All right. Th I thought so. All right. Just make sure. Steph, you what said I you mean had a by question. it doesn't say it better <laughs> is that like, any anything that's ever written down is just can be conveyed through a particular language at a particular time, and it, it, I think the gauge of better or worse is just not accurate. Like it's just because most people just want to say, "Oh, the Bible said it better," because it's the Bible, not because. Well, like, I said the Bible says it's better because it says in what Calvin said in like a thousand words, and apparently wasn't even done yet. The Bible says in like two mm -hmm. sentences. Well, yeah, exactly. Or, or, or it's a debate over volume of words, and it's like few word better. Like, what is what does he say in uh, the office? Like, me, me use trick. Few word do better. Don't use many words. Like, okay. Oh yeah, okay. Why use many word when few word do trick? Like, what is his name? Kevin <laughs> on the office? Yeah. Like, why you has been... That's like caveman argumentation. <laughs> Jesse says the Bible is written by caveman. 
Okay. Oh um, my God. Yeah, I don't know, Jesse, if I'd ever say, like, nothing Calvin ever penned is better by any metric than anything in the Bible. Like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to well, say no, that. No, no, I wasn't saying story. that either. I wasn't saying that either. I'm not just saying anything that Calvin wrote is better than what the Bible wrote. I'm just saying, like, I don't know, you would just say, like, no, the Bible said it better because it's in fewer words. Like, back pedaling no. from the fires of hell. Uh, Steph, you had a question you said you were going to raise in a little bit. Oh, Did I you forgot. Have... Yep. Seriously? No, well, okay. All right. Here. So, listen, the message at my church this week um, was about um, uh, Jacob wrestling the angel, right? And so the the message was really, really, really good. Um, and I could go into the whole thing, but it was awesome. It was, it was kind of the, the point of it was that, like, God could have rescued Jacob from the situation earlier and didn't. Um, so there came a point where Jacob would not have learned in earnest what he needed to learn until he was jumped by God, scared and alone in the forest after being at risk of losing everything. Right. So it, it was sort of like, I think his point was generally like, we don't like if God isn't rescuing us from something, that's not a good reason to despair. Right. And it, there was a lot more nuance than that, but that's kind of what jumped out at me. Um, but as we're going through it, I guess my question, and I have some ideas about why, but why would God allow himself? Okay. So when it says that the point where, and I forget how it's worded, it says that God dislocated his hip, right? Or harmed that tendon or, or injured the hip, whatever. And so it said that God did that because he was losing. So I guess my question is, how do you, yeah, how do you interpret this story where God is like, and, and I guess my thought is that it's something performative, right, for our benefit later or for Jacob's benefit to be forced into receiving the blessing, right? But why does the Bible word it that the angel is losing the battle, must injure the hip, and then is threatened and not released? Like, well, I don't know. Why Why'd the writer word it that way? My first non-biblical thoughts that Chris will correct are because, one— uh, the people who are supposed to get it are going to get it, and the people who are not are really not. The other one would be, it would be like if, if I'm wrestling my dog, and I'm like laying on the floor with my you know feet behind me, and I'm using one arm to like wrestle my dog, and then he gets pretty aggressive, and I'm like, oh my gosh, he's actually stronger than I thought. And it's like, oh no, how am I ever going to win? It's like, oh, okay, I'll just use both hands and you know unbend my feet. Okay, now I'm winning. Those are my thoughts. Uh, all right, Chris. Biblical version. I mean, I'm just, I'm going to the passage because I'm just not, you know, like, I don't remember it saying that God was losing. Hold on. Yeah. Let me, I'll find it and read it. Yeah, it's Genesis 32. I just got to find it. Okay. Here, I'll unmute. Uh, uh, hold on. We're getting there. Genesis. 32. Okay. So Jacob knows that Esau has threatened to kill him after their father dies. Um, Jacob starts sending away his possessions and his family because he's trying to avoid this death sentence from his brother. Um, then 22. So then he's hiding alone. Uh, and he says, it says in 22, during the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two servant wives, his 11 sons. Um, all of his possessions went to the other side of the river. Then Jacob left all alone in the camp. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. I'm sorry. Let me get out of the NLT for Chris's benefit. Okay. <sighs> the same night he rose, he took his two wives. Okay. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him, and he passed. Peniel is the first one, and then Penuel, limping because of his hip. 
Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is in the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Chris, can I add a complicated question too? Um, like, of course, this, this being had to know Jacob's name was Jacob, right? Like, what is your name? Like, it's like God in the Garden of Adam and Eve, like at Gar Garden of Adam and Eve, in the Garden with Adam and Eve. It's like, where were you? Of course he knew. So it's like, what is your name? Like, surely he knew his name was Jacob. Okay. Well, real quick. So the pastor had touched on that. So I guess Jacob, and I did not verify this on my own. Someone correct me. Jacob is, is like, he gave this long string of words and he summarized it as deceiver. Like, because Jacob was named because he had pulled Esau's heel, right? He had, his, he was born with his hand around his heel and then he had used trickery to receive blessings throughout his night, his life. So him admitting his name Jacob was a, an act of like, well, I am called a deceiver. And then he was given the name Israel, which is one who wrestles with God, but it implies overcomer. So his name was changed from deceiver to overcomer. So God asking his name was actually very intentional. It was like trying, it was getting Jacob to admit what he's been doing his whole life. That was my pastor's take. Yeah, that's a good point, Pastor Steph. Uh, my pastor's take. Nope, that, that did not come from me. <laughs> uh, Chris, you ready? Have you read your tome yet? Yeah, give me a second. So that was part of the message was like, well, he, he's, he's been brought to a place where after deceiving his whole life, trying to gain the blessing, like he knew God existed. He was a man of that faith, but he wasn't a man of integrity. So saying my name is Deceiver, God, God allowed him to get to this point of honesty of, you know, I, I have nowhere to go except to admit that I'm a deceiver. Um, I guess the part I'm curious about is why does it say the man did not prevail? And is, is it that like my, my thought is that it's God maneuvering like both physically and emotionally Jacob into this place. But I would want to make sure that's right before I adopt that as my interpretation. Right. So, so it was just that it was a stalemate. And so the idea was not winning or losing. The idea was the wrestling itself. It was the struggle itself. Um, no one will ever prevail against God struggling with God. Um, you know, and God does not struggle with us. And so this is, this is simply a, it's simply a story to show that um, it's okay to struggle with God but it's not okay to struggle against God, if that makes sense. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, so it's just, he was wrestled to a, they wrestled all night to a stalemate, and then when the sun was coming up, that's when the angel of the Lord, you know, touched his thigh. So when, then Jacob says, I'm not going to let you go until you receive a blessing, is it correct for me to say that God is sort of saying there, I mean, he could just go at any time, but this, this whole thing sure. is sort of performative for Jacob's benefit. Yes. Everything God does for us is okay. performative for, for well, for uh, eventually for his glory, but yeah, because God doesn't have to do anything. Well, yeah, I know. Okay. But when we see Moses confronted via a burning bush and Moses is like horrified and floored, kicks off his shoes, falls on his face, holy ground, right? That's how I would expect this to go down for Jacob. So, like, why is it that there's this whole act of the wrestling and the let me go and the, the cheating with the, the hip thing? Well, it wasn't his cheating. It was just that he stopped the match. And, and the whole thing is that he is wanting Jacob to wrestle with God to redeem that idea and change his name to one who wrestles with God from deceiver. Your pastor is exactly correct on that. So it's like, this is a, this is a redemptive act, not a salvational redemptive act because Jacob already had faith, but like, this is a redemptive act to redeem the idea of Jacob as a father of nations. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah, so then the message went on and, and the pastor was saying that, you know, how to help identify moments where we're being called into this same sort of situation um, in life. So, okay, the way you just explained that sort of filled in that gap for me. Thank you. 
Good work is being done here today. Well, I haven't been keeping up on chat. Um, anyone talking about anything interesting in chat? Well, brother just added other layers of complication. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with the answer I was given. <laughs> Okay. Jesse, you have any knowledge or wisdom to impart? No, I'm solid right now. I think so. Jesse, are you going to make up with Tyler? Probably. Are there more fights going on? No, no. They just had a little spat yesterday, but I wanted to make sure. I mean, look, my, I would, like, I'm 31. I'm not going to hold a grudge, but I mean, the thing that pissed me off is he's not allowed to get up there and start cursing. So Not allowed to what? Start cursing. Tyler and Jesse were arguing about um, the personhood, uh, you know, Trinitarian issues yesterday. And Tyler just started absolutely, like, things that would make you blush. You what? Know, really? His name. Yeah. And what is Tyler? Because no one has their actual name. Like, Tyler means, like, you know, like... Some other name. He right? was Ian Sinius, and now he's uh, yeah. something else. <laughs> yeah, that that's such a weird thing. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I mean, I mean, it just seems. I don't know. Like cursing like a sailor while talking about you know the amazing love of Jesus, is is just doesn't. It's like oil and vinegar or oil and water. It just doesn't really mix together. And it's like you know a Catholic dude yesterday. How he's like, I wish this didn't curse, and um. Then him and, like, the other Orthodox guy kind of got into it a little bit. Well, not got into it, but we're, he was pressing him. He's like, why don't you go to confession? Why don't you confess me, you curse? He's like, I don't need to do that. It's a venial sin. It's not a mortal sin. I'm just like, ah, that's funny when they fight each other. Um, well, I, I mean, Ito is Orthodox and Viper's Catholic. That's not Yeah, really... I know. Okay. I'm going to say it again. It's basically the same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah, that's one thing. I mean, again, with Catholics, I have uh, whatever. We don't need to go into it. But I am very, I'm, I'm very confused about the mortal versus venial sins thing. Um, that, that is just a very confusing doctrine to me. And you know, that was a great example where he was like, "Oh well, I don't." The Catholic said, "I don't need to, I don't need to confess when I curse because it's a venial sin." And it's, it's like, so well. <laughs> Okay. Yes. <laughs> so they can have their sinful cake and eat it too. <laughs> I mean, I would take a more charitable look at it than that. Okay. I don't think it's that. I, I think it's that like they've had to do so much math and like figure out where the lines are um, that, that then you can permit things that you ought not like, I, okay. I cuss, right? Like, but really only in front of my husband Steph. or I know. I will cuss in front of my husband or I have a couple of really good friends that are Christians that, are, that know me as a Christian, right? So I'm not worried about harming my witness. I'll cuss in front of them, right? Um, or sometimes when I'm alone in my car and someone cuts me off, a, a nice little word will, will slip out of my mouth. And I will repent, right? This is actually something I repent of often is like, Lord, I'm sorry for, you know, using this language and da-da-da. But it's, it's not something I would do in front of non-Christians. It's not something I do on Clubhouse because you never know who's listening. So I kind of agree with him that it's like, yeah, I mean, I don't know that you need to flog yourself over it, right? But in the case of Tyler yesterday, it was very much like, boy, he, that was not a little like, ah, oh, bleep it, this person cut me off, right? That was like, he just went straight for the every word he could think of. Wow. Well, I mean, I'm not in the habit of like flogging myself either, but I mean, you know, I used to cuss like crazy. So, I mean, maybe, maybe that's why I more, pay more attention to it now. But, I mean, you know, I, I still do. Like, you know, it's, it's rare. But, I mean, it will typically show itself like when I stub my toe or hit myself with a hammer or things that cause me pain. I'm like, ah! And then a word will come out. But, I mean, in casual conversation, like, no, I, I, I pretty much never do it in, like, casual conversation. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not a saint, by the way, if anyone thought that. Uh, we got plenty of plenty of other issues. Um, sorry to disappoint.
Um, are we all done? Everyone good? Chris, are you at your church appointment? Wait, um, Todd. Todd, you should come up. I want to I wanna catch up. But then I don't know. The thing I want to ask you about, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask you about, so actually I might not. Um, Tyler, I'll allow it. <laughs> oh. No, no, no. <laughs> um, Is it the Todd? Hey, the Todd. What's up? Well, he said it in the Discord, but so I think it's kind of public, but I don't know if it's super public, so I don't want to put him on the spot. Can't raise his hand. Okay. Um, oh, the Calvinist. <laughs> Tyler cussing like a yeah. sailor. What? What's up? Oh, yeah, the Calvinist Todd. Yeah, Good morning. Todd. Calvinist Todd. Good morning, Todd. Hi, Calvinist Todd. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> um, Todd, you said um, Tyler cussing like a sailor. Have you not heard him cuss before? That guy can really, like rip it like what sets him up he's like how do how does one be saved and he's like well you've got to f and f and f and f and do this believe jesus hallelujah amen ff no, I mean, how does that come no, about no. like when he gets when someone's like i think you're incorrect on a position he's like well blah 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 like how does that come about well it doesn't take much to escalate him like he and jesse yesterday were getting a little heated and they were starting to cut each other off a little bit because they're you know and then chris is trying to get in and say you know, here's what this person is saying, and here's what that person is saying. So where Jesse is like, hey, you're not listening, Tyler goes, well, F you. <laughs> it, was, it was a pretty stark uh, raising of the bar. But he's also called, well, like one of his favorite words to use is the F word that means someone who's gay. Like he will just toss that one around. I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I have a different view on that. Like it's certainly not nice, and it's not going to help your Christian witness. But I, I wouldn't consider that like swearing. And like the guy that points out, like you know, the, the four letter words are not curses. Oh uh, no, not like a, uh, I not like how Jesus cursed the fig tree. Not like an actual like curse you're pronouncing like that. But I mean, you know, colloquialisms now swear words equate to when someone says you're using curse words. That's what they mean. Anyway, but yeah, yeah, the other f word that's like the slur. Like I, I wouldn't. I, I mean, that I don't think that's considered. It can't be considered profanity. But it is a slur, and it's certainly not going to help probably people come closer to Jesus. I don't know. I feel like that's a curse word. I, I feel like that counts as, like, a, a pretty nasty word. The Bible says there's no corrupt communication to see out of your mouth. What? He is talking about let, the Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed from your mouth. So that goes above swearing. That, that yeah. covers, like, everything. That's telling, like, bad jokes or something or off-color stuff, like... Kind of like secularly, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. Kind of like that. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> You've had a lot of feedback. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think I've heard Tyler cuss that much. I must just have not been around when he does it. Get him in here and ask him some tough questions. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I mean, I've removed him from this room before for doing that. Oh. Yeah, so loved. Like, if it helps, just every time you've heard us talking about curse words today, just replace it with swear words, and then your problem is fine. No one's taking an oath wanting, wanting like, crickets to, you know, multiplying your bed beneath the sheets or something, or plagues of locusts. <laughs> like, just every time you've heard someone say a curse, curse today, just replace that with swear words. I prefer cuss. Like, you know, quit cussing. Same. You take off the G. Just quit cussing. Exactly. You have a lot more Midwest than I thought up there in uh, northern New York. No have I not done my native accent for you? <laughs> when I moved to New York City and then to Virginia... I had to work very hard to get rid of this horrific accent I had that actually is a lot more like this. So if you talk to my mom or to anyone else in my family, we all talk like this, completely through the nose and very like back of the van, Rochester sort of oh. accent. And so I got made fun of so bad that I had to stop. And now I consciously have to not do this. Yeah, you should not do that. Yeah. Yeah, see? That's worse than cussing. <laughs> is it though? 
Well, technically, probably not. But for my, yeah, uh, I'll just say no to both. <laughs> I think the Boston accent is the worst one, though. Like, by far. It's not even close. It's a horrific accent. What's the, the khakis one? Oh, yeah, the khakis. It's like a meme. It's like, yeah, it's Boston. You want some, you want some khakis? No, I want my khakis. Your khakis. Khakis. Uh, I need my khaki. <laughs> khaki pants? Ever my watch khakis. This Old House? It's like painful. It's awful. What a horrible accent. Who did that? <laughs> it was probably God's actual curse upon them for burning all the witches. Or all the, yeah, you know, actually, that not tracks. Witches. Yeah. So, like, there we go. A citation of a real curse. You know, hypothetically. I mean, for what it's worth on the word thing, not the accent thing, I really enjoy the word retard. So. It bothers me. It is like a pet peeve when words like, uh, like that, like talking about like a fire class and people who are so trigger sensitive like, don't use that don't use that it's like what no it's like the, the correct like fire related word or like a medical definition it's like it's the correct term like i'm sorry you automatically think about you know like um like a certain group of like you know m mentally challenged people but that's not the word and like people are so well <laughs> that word is a slur that they they think you cannot use that in any sense even in completely appropriate um, forms like medicine or fire. Oh, you know what's uh, bless you, dear. You know what's one in my field is in New York now. You can't legally say or write master bedroom when you're referring to a master bedroom in a house. Really? Oh, because of yep. slavery. Yes, you can freaking, have your license. Oh, yeah. freaking commies. Can you just yeah, write it anyways and let them fire no, you and then sue no. someone for it? If you put in a listing, right? I don't do residential, so this isn't really my problem. But if we put in a listing like beautiful bedroom and master bath or master ensuite or anything like that, you will get a dock against your license. And three, three events is a removal. Like you lose your job. We need someone to fall on that sword, get removed for that, sue, take it to the Supreme Court, and hopefully they'll be like, no, you can't do that. You have to give a you know, give this person a fat check. Will you be that person to fall on your sword? Uh, yeah, no. Nope, that will not be me. I already have an ethics violation, so I only have two more for my entire career. No one's going to ask me about that? All right. Wait. I was answering email. Sorry. Yes. Tell us about your ethics violation. Uh, she wants to Des talk about it. Don't deserved go, or don't go go why were you game. persecuted? <laughs> no, I had a I had a client who switched loan types in the middle of the loan process without telling me, and that's an ethical violation. So I got a mm. I got a doc on my record now. You can't say that you're buying it in a conventional loan and then switch to an FHA loan. Everybody, you do that, your agent gets a demerit. So you got a in trouble for something your client did with that you had no yeah. knowledge of because it would ex it was expected that i would have been aware of that event and did not disclose it to the other agent so i actually had to prove that i did not know but i still got the demerit yep it's a dangerous world we live in y'all that is so stupid along with some other with some other stupid things i'm dealing with um that really just makes me not want to like play in the system at all. Like that makes me just want to like cash out and become like quasi Amish. I mean, really, right like, now you're talking. Yes, exactly. My, my mother-in-law has like a bunch of farmland in Nebraska. Like we could cash out, like build, build a decent house, like on the land, have tons of acreage. And if we could just figure out how to like keep ourselves alive with like farming and stuff. Um, yeah. Like a Christian commune, like, Except that we get to keep it from turning into a cult. But assuming we had a good chance of doing that, that I think would be the way to go. I, I'm just so sick of, yeah, uh, how everything is uh, is just unfolding in this world. I agree. And New York seems to be on the forefront. I mean, 
not that we're all super interested in real estate policy, but like your real estate agent in New York has to hand a piece of paper. Every client I ever work with, I have to hand them a piece of paper that says, if you think I've been racist or discriminatory, here's a number <laughs> where you can. Yep. It's called a fair housing disclosure. And it actually says, here's an anonymous phone number where you can report my violation and I will have to go through a hearing. And I have to hand them this piece of paper with a smile on my face and then they sign it and then I have to keep it on file for every person I ever work with. And it literally is like, here's permission if you just don't like this person, here's the phone number. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you can bring your Angora rabbit fur or, and your loom and you can make clothes for everyone. And um, yeah, someone could be a farmer. What could Chris do? Um, I would say schoolmaster, teaching, teaching, the the next, teaching the next generation. It'd be like smacking all their hands and stuff and making them write like a thousand times on chalkboards so their knuckles are bloody. What would you have them write? Chris, what would you have them write? Like a thousand sentences. Like, I will not do this or I will not do this. Like, what would be the sentence? For, for what? I'm sorry. <sighs> you're a schoolmaster on our Christian compound and uh, you're, you're the school teacher. So, you know, being a hard schoolmaster as we project you to be, um, you'd have the kids like writing like, I will not do this or I will not do that. Like, like old school, how they used to. What's the sentence you would have them write? Like until their poor little hands are bleeding. So when I was in Catholic school, we would have jug, which was judgment under God. And I was there a lot. And so <laughs> they, they dead. would, they would have, the, right. they would have the uh, teacher, whoever was, grudgingly having to handle the tension that day um take a quote from any classical work of literature and you had to copy that 500 times and then you could go and so you got really good at writing really quickly is that what um you would do just random books or the works of calvin and just have them it was a catholic school they're not going to be pulling out calvin but no you um, you oh me uh sure i mean it gave me a great hatred for classic literature for a little <laughs> while so i probably wouldn't do that but yeah. so i actually do this uh when my kid accidentally forgets her homework at school i will give her like copy work to do and uh yeah we actually most recently i had her do it out of little house on the prairie but i'll tell her an hour you have to copy for an hour and i don't want to see your hand or that pen down <laughs> Does she forget her homework often now, or is she learning to no, not forget? No, she had to do that three times because her homework takes her 15 minutes, but copy work takes her an hour. So I tell her, yeah. it's your choice. You can do homework, you can do copy work. So that worked. Maybe I'd be a good schoolmaster. Uh, no, I get very angry. Oh, yeah, you're the seamstress. You're the loomstress. Or the thick and keep. The clothier. Well, anyone see the Iowa caucus last night? Hello, CEO. How are you doing? Feel free to jump up here. What were the results? Yeah, Trump, Trump slayed. He got like 50%. And they're like, he'll never get 50%, but if he does, it'll be a feat never accomplished before. We'll be talking about it till the end of time. I woke up this morning, they're like, yeah, I got 50%. Yeah, it's going to be great. He's going to get defe defeated in the Electoral College, and we're going to get four more years of Biden. It's awesome. Thank oh, he, you, he, Iowa. He's, he's going to get assassinated. But that's not the right – that is not the reason to do it. No, may justice be uh, justice be done, may the heavens fall. If I'm going to keep using that quote, I should remember how it goes. But that's it. Like, you do you do the right thing for the right reasons. I mean, if you if you think the right reason is voting for – not voting for Trump, then fine. But if you're doing it – if you're not voting for Trump just to select a, a candidate that is okay – as a Republican, um, but and you think they can get elected uh, just because the other guy, assuming you think Trump would be the other guy, would do a better job for the country, but he's unelectable? No. You, you vote for the guy who would do the better job for the country and then just protest your heart off or something. So that uh, – actually nothing to do with politics, but that does bring a uh, moral quandary to mind that actually I want to pose to you guys. I had 
put it in a paper last night and uh, got a hundred percent on the paper. Yeah. Yeah, break my shoulders off a little bit, but uh, we don't have to dress it now. But I do have an interesting moral quandary. But what is it? We seem to have nothing else. Okay. So, uh, who? Eh, I'm trying to do. It. I don't think I want to make it personal. Um, make it personal, you, Steph. All right, all right. We can make it personal, Steph. <laughs> Steph, do you believe in the age of accountability? Yes. Okay, does your model of the age of accountability mean that those that precede it cannot be judged by God? They cannot be held accountable. Cannot? Uh, God can do whatever he wants, but I don't, I don't think God does. Okay, let me pull up my paper. Well, it, we just want to instill rules for the theory, right? So basically it sounds like... Am I being the bad guy? Yes. You cannot be held accountable before... Yeah, sure, yes. Okay, cannot be held accountable prior to the age of accountability. Now, you also affirm uh, Exodus 26, right? Like 20, chapter 20, verse 6, what right? What was it there? I mean, yes. Uh, you shall not murder. Yes. Okay, hold on. Let me pull, I'm pulling up my paper so I can just pull all the references right off the top of my hand. Top How of long head. is this paper out of curiosity? It's three pages. Oh, um, front and back? Uh, well... <laughs> It, if it's online, it doesn't really make a difference. But it's three pages, <laughs> double space, twelve point five. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So you believe in Exodus? Actually, it says twenty thirteen. So it's uh, Exodus twenty thirteen. Maybe I was thinking it was the sixth commandment of the ten. Um, you and Genesis nine six, right? Shall not murder by the hand. But one is slain. That that one will be taken from him. Um, and Romans. 3, 8. You also affirm Romans 3, 8, right? That furthermore, we understand that we ought not to do evil that good may come, correct? Yes. Okay. If under the age of accountability, individuals do not, they cannot be held accountable to God, and therefore the default position out of that is salvation, what moral obligation do you have to actually ma commit mass abortion? Well, that was Did a twist. Mm -hmm. Wait, because I'm the right. Okay, so this is the same the trolley the problem. Woman. Yeah, do you guys remember that woman um, who she had a long litany list of mental disorders, um, schizophrenia, you know, just untreated. And she was a Christian, and she killed all five of her children because she didn't want them to have the chance of going to hell. Do you remember? Like this sounds like yeah, her line yes. of thinking. Is I've that... never heard of that, but that's interesting. Okay, what, yeah. So is that what you're getting at here? Uh, basically, right. What what moral obligation do you have if you simultaneously affirm the principle uh, of sanctity of life, right, informing yep. you deontologically that murder is wrong, right, and, right, that age of accountability will ensure eternal life, yep. not just temporary life, right? Because Mine is really quick, principle, Nate. I'm going to go. Okay, because then you're, you, the, if, the question would, like, should a baby murder another baby like that no. would be a much more right so like that but the person who's advocating for abortion is past the age of accountability and is consciously advocating for but then you're saying there's nothing wrong with that because they'd get to heaven well then you're playing god so that's my very short answer is we're not and my answer well, is shorter no. well, my, we're my, can, you, can you do two answers at once okay my, my answer is because we could be wrong so Whenever atheists ask us, we're like, well, Christians just want abortion and pro-choice because they're guaranteed to go to heaven. We could be wrong. Just because we believe that, I really believe, you know, like, you know, babies would go to heaven. But I would hate to find out, oh, I was wrong. Oops, God's doing something different because God can do that. So th th that's my answer because we yeah. don't know. So that would be – that wouldn't be – there wouldn't really be a uh, – wouldn't really be a sufficient response because the response is going to be – operating on principles that are for all intents and purposes objective right like like it, the, obviously yeah. if that's the case and you're just gonna you're just gonna depend on like limited knowledge right and fallibility in our ascertain assertion of what is god's law right or what exactly god does in what circumstances then then the crisis doesn't arise so it's just not it's not a true trolley problem at that point which is fine Right. 
but it's not a true trolley problem. So what we want to do is we want, if you want a real trolley problem, you want to say, okay, no, the principle of sanctity of life exists. It informs us in what context taking a life may be justified. In the first context, right, murder is unjustified, it is unjustified taking of life. On that principle, you're violating the principle, don't do it, right? But on the other, if you commit abortion, right, and the age of accountability is true, right, then you, that same principle on the sanctity of life would actually inform you that you ought to take as many li infant lives as possible prior to like birth. Like if they're in the stomach, like kill them, right? Because you're ensuring eternal salvation and you're operating from the same principle that life is sacred. So it would be it would be immoral for you to not kill as many children as possible. Are we commanded to take life the way that God is allowed to? Well, I don't think you can in the same way that God is allowed to, but right. It's not because the issue is yes, you'd be vi you'd be violating the principle, right, which is do not murder, but that's going to be the same exact issue as like literally the trolley problem, right? You have a train coming down the train tracks it's going to kill five people and you have one tied to another train track and if you if you divert the the way that the train's going it's going to kill the one but save the five and the issue is nonetheless is that you become the murderer of the one whereas if you remained passive you technically would not be responsible for any so the question is in that trolley problem is should you affirm romans 3 8 right where it says that we ought not to do evil that good may come Right. And the question is, can you apply that same reasoning? Because most Christians absolutely would say, yes, you should actively engage the trolley problem. You should divert the train. The train should go and kill the one to save the five. Right. Because where the principles at stake, saving the more the greater number of lives is going to be the greater good. No. Well, uh, yeah. And, and I guess I'm done playing with this game. I've, I've kind of maxed out. But I, I like to break the trolley problem because it's not a problem because people, again, it's these intangibles. Like I, I get, you know, that you play in that game where things have to be objective. But I mean, you know, there's one thing they don't consider, and that's, you know, the Holy Spirit living in us, guiding us into all understanding and truth. So I believe that's a thing. So if we're standing there, only God knows, uh, you know, what's going to convict someone's heart. So if I'm standing there, it's like I do nothing and people die. I do something, something dies. Then if, if I feel like a certain way, like I'm, I'm convicted, like, you know, like one way the or another. Is how do you discern which convictions are of the spirit and which convictions are of a sinful heart? Right. I mean, if I, the, well, 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 I have an answer. If the people asking the question will lay themselves on the track and put me in that situation, I'll let them know. Yeah. And I mean, look, I, I know I, I, I understand your logic. Right. Nate. And I appreciate it for what it is. But when you have the responsibility of navigating ethical issues and you need to, you need to basically formulate Christian discernment for others. What you're doing is you're giving them a system of critical reasoning and you're giving them a methodology by which to transverse a sinful world. Right. So well, that's not uh, going to be a sufficient uh, well, uh, system to navigate moral quandaries. Well, neither is yours because it's it's objective when there's subjective things. Like we don't know the people and like the butterfly effect. Like we don't know. There cannot be a one size fits all, in my opinion, answer because that, that would change every time. It depends who the people are. It depends no. what's going to happen. To, oh, hang on. Oh, okay, I get it. But this is my stance. It depends what's going to happen, you know, a thousand years down the road. Like based on what you're doing, your actions are going to have um, indeterminable you can't consequences. Account for that. You can only account for what actions you can impose into the scenario. And right? I'm saying, because, yeah, and I'm saying the conviction would be different each time. So maybe one time it's one way, maybe time your another time. conviction in the trolley problem with the five versus the one right there? That's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. It's not concrete. It's ethereal and like vapid right now. Like you need to put me on a train track with people tied down and put the lever in my hand. They'd be like, "This is happening right now." I'd be like, "Oh crap! Okay, here's what we're dealing with." Yeah. Um, this is what I'm doing. But if we're just like ethereal talking in a non-concrete example, you cannot hammer. I don't believe you can hammer an answer down because you don't know. You're not in a concrete example. Um, yeah, I mean, Jesse, I love you, but it's just your, that's not. I have a question. In your um, situation, in your proposal, whatever, whatever that word is, uh, does is God aware that that it could 
that all babies go to hell and so therefore if humans kill them they'll go to hell or go to heaven i'm sorry that all babies will go to heaven so if we kill them then they would go to heaven does god know this well it's it's not about what was so look i'm not dodging the question i'll answer the question but it's not about what god knows because your because it's it's the issue of your epistemic apprehension of ethics right it's i get it but it's relevant like because okay, Eddie, because whatever is the fact of the matter is what God knows, because he determined it to be the way that it is, right? Like, your, all okay. God knows all things. It's just taken as a given. So then why would God, knowing that that was the case, tell us not to kill children? <laughs> well, well, obviously, I would say it's because it's just immoral, the sanctity of life. But the, qu- the question <laughs> but is within your not. question. Not, not what Jesse thinks. Within your question, why would God both know that the murdering of children would cause all of them to be in heaven and then simultaneously tell people not to murder children? Well, that's the moral. Yeah, that's the moral quandary. I mean, that is. Well, yeah, so I, it, what's less relevant in the question is whether I would kill my children. What's more relevant is like if God yeah. knew this is true. Right. Yeah. And then God determined that this was true. And we're assuming the age of accountability and the 100 percent chance of going to heaven. Right. So yeah. if God knew that was true, then also told us not to do it. The only answer I can give to your quandary is we cannot do it because an all knowing God whose brain works infinitely better than mine said no. Yes. Right. Yeah. So we may land at a place where it's like we don't 100 percent know why this would, this is the commandment, but (laughs) do you see what I'm saying? Like there's a problem. I I see see what you're saying. We're going to have to put a pin in this. Yeah. Well, just let me, one final. Yeah. Real quick. I do want to hear what he thinks about that. I I see what you're saying, but that's exactly why it's a moral quandary because the issue is, is that you, you can't like you as an individual before divine revelation cannot affirm that God simultaneously knows that all children will go to hell and yet be, a morally coherent God that then prescribes you to do that by that, which is by contrast evil, right? Like it would be a positive good on a, a high view of AOA to kill as many children as possible. And therefore that commandment of God would itself be immoral, right? Thank goodness. You don't have to affirm the AOA. Okay. We're done. We're done. Right. We heard his answer. Wait, so no, I, I'm dying. I'm dying. It's never going to end. It's never going to end. See you. What the? Oh, uh, hey, you need to take some philosophy classes, please. man. No, you stop got, it. Go to, call, not, go go to college. college. I have a nice Enjoy way it. to tie it up. Look, Jesse, in at that point, Nate. Hey, oh, you modded him? Okay. Jesse, at that point, no. you stepped outside of Christianity. Oh, hold on. So, that's that. Yes, yes. Jesse stepped outside of Christianity. You're a demon, Jesse. I'm not going to be Philip. No, it's like no. The, it, it, it's like the me too of pseudo philosophical people. Like I went to college, bro. Like I went to college. It's vapid and it's useless. Like bite me. Hello, Brian. How are you doing? How's your day? Hey, buddy. I'm doing well. Do you want to tell me to read a book or anything like that? <laughs> I was just sitting here wondering what if the what if the one guy was like a cancer researcher that cures cancer in the world or something. I know, but Jesse don't care about that. Yeah, yeah Brian, that's a good question. So, so that, okay. I'm sorry, Nate. I'm going to respond. Okay. Brian got it exactly what I was trying to get at, which is this would be immoral whether the human could figure it out or not because God said it's immoral. And a great tangible example is one that Brian just gave. So you may assure that the child would go to heaven by murdering them, but lose out on the cure of cancer. So God said, right? So I think that's a decent argument. But the answer is you're not going to be able to logically walk yourself to a place with the premise that Jesse set up where it's immoral, other than what Brian just said. Amen. I wish we could hear Jesse's response. But we can't because I, I'm, I'm over it, dude. Like some people just can't communicate. Every time he talks, it's like real quick. And like an hour later... I'm like beating my head against the door. He's like, you just don't like philosophy. You need to go to college. It's like Philip. Remember that? Well, yeah. Like, Phil, like Phil pers- personal- is personalities just clash. Worse. Like if someone wants to dribble on and talk about endless, mindless philosophy, like the wisdom of the world, I think in Corinthians, the Bible says something about that. Like the, the mindless, like high philosophies of man. 
um, compared to like the spiritual, you know, the foolishness of God and like the spiritual discernment that comes with God. You know, I will be a fool for Christ happily over vat in a jar type stuff. Did you say vat in a jar? Yes. Okay. CEO, how's your day going? Is he speaking? Is he on the phone? Did I just kill the room? I feel like I killed the room. Well, Brian, how you been? I'm doing well. Um, I, I, I was hoping that I could take two seconds and answer a question that, uh, that, that Steph had. Yeah, go ahead. I was about to ask about that. That'd be more than two seconds. Uh, no, it, it's, it's pr pretty, pretty <laughs> easy. It's, it's, it's not difficult. Um, in, in Luke 23, 34, Jesus, um, says, father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so the question is simply what, what, what's going on here, right? When, when Jesus says, father, forgive them. And, um, a, a couple of things to remember is that the, the, What's going on in the crucifixion and in Jesus's statement is not merely for the people, you know, standing there in front of them, uh, in front of him. Uh, I, I doubt seriously that Jesus is speaking of the Romans who were simply doing their their jobs. In fact, one could even argue that uh, that they were not uh, in crucifying a criminal and performing their duties as Roman soldiers were actually sinning. So. Um, though the crucifixion of the Son of God uh, was a wicked event, I don't think Jesus was looking at the soldiers and saying, Father, forgive them. Uh, nor when, when we consider the crowds, you had curiosity seekers and you had uh, genuine disciples and you had um, priests and you had scribes and you had Pharisees and you, you had a whole group of people. And so the question, Father, forgive them, what's, what's going on here? Well, you've got an issue of uh, forgiveness based upon ignorance. And this, this idea is communicated in, in several places in Scripture. You know, uh, Peter uh, standing in uh, Solomon's portico. You know, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. Uh, but what God foretold by the mouth of the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he fulfilled. And so this kind of language is used multiple times in Scripture. It's not that they were ignorant of their hatred or they're ignorant of whatever. They were ignorant of what God was doing and accomplishing. And so they, they were ignorant of the true nature of the Messiah and his work and his kingdom. And so uh, while they weren't ignorant regarding their own sin and motives, they were absolutely ignorant of God's motives and what God was accomplishing. And so um, in, in the final uh, casting away of the old covenant, in the putting away of the old covenant and the dismantling of old covenant Israel and the destruction of Jerusalem, God truly gave 40 years of forbearance where many tens of thousands of these Jews are converted, thousands on the day of Pentecost, many more thousands in chapter 4. In chapter 6, many of the priests are converted uh, to Christ. And so uh, what's going on here, I believe, is Jesus looking at uh, his cross work and knowing those responsible for his crucifixion being Jerusalem, he prays, and, and the Father answers this prayer in his forbearance and the, and the, the conversion of a remnant of, of Jews. Uh, it, but it doesn't have anything to do with, oh, what, what's going on with man's free will and, and, and Calvinism, and it, it doesn't have anything at all to do with that. But rather, Jesus acknowledging and uh, leaning into God's purpose in his cross work to save a people to himself and even to see the fulfillment of that in Israel, I believe in this 40 years of forbearance um, for them before he brings that, that terrible judgment in 70 AD. And that was the quick answer. <laughs> I'm okay. kidding, that was good. There's Thank you, Brian. some stuff in there that I'm not 100% familiar with, but I, I think like 
it's still unlike the example in Peter, right? We have one member of the Godhead trying to persuade or not trying to persuade, but do you know what? A, a, appealing to another. And so that seems to fly in the face of determinism in general, right? So, so I see what you're saying about the rest of it. And I, I actually, un, I understand and agree. I don't see how it jives with any kind of determinist view. Yeah. Uh, again, the, the, every, everything that is said, um, by Christ is said for our benefit. This is this, this is for us. When when Jesus uh, is is on the cross, the things that are said and recorded are are for us. They show us the love and the mercy of God. They they show us uh, the 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 grace of the Father in extending forty years of forbearance to Israel, and not when He came into His own and His own received Him not. The father didn't simply wipe them off the map when they crucified his son. And so, um, so yeah, this, this idea of father forgive them for they know not what they do. He, he's not looking down at the individuals right there and saying, God, I want you to forgive that one right there and that one right there and that one right there. Again, this is, this is looking at the cross bigger picture. It's looking at redemptive history bigger to see what, what God is doing. and. And what Christ prays is perfectly. What is it, me or him? Uh, him, he got a call. Back to your answer in a moment. Hmm. I still wonder, though. Like, I understand it. Yeah, oh, Brian, you were gone. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, but it, my, my, my point is it, it doesn't have anything to do with some type of, of free will. I mean, like literally every single thing that I've explained is held to whether, um, whether somebody's a Calvinist or, or some kind of Wesleyan or whether they're, they're whatever. This, this, this isn't a controversial or contorted way to, to understand this passage. This is pretty much a consistent standard way to understand what's going on in this passage. Yeah, no, I get that. Um, and, and I'm not pointing at any one tradition. I'm saying determinism in, in general. So like, it, I guess if God, I don't understand why God would do this for our benefit if he wanted us to understand that he was determinist. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, it seems to, the way you're interpreting it, then it would lead you off the track because it would be one thing if John said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. But the fact that the Son said it in the throes of death on the cross makes it a little more difficult to reconcile. Like, again, one member of the Godhead pleading with another, both are omniscient, both, are determ both have determined this. Um, whether it's for our benefit or not, it doesn't seem to make sense that God would make public and record that statement, right? Yeah, I, I think I think Steph, I think one of your challenges is you try to read everything with some kind of Calvinist goggles to try to see <laughs> determinism under un, under everything, not recognizing in in this case one um, the 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 hypostatic union of two natures, the the idea of the communicado right in relation to what is what is attributed to one or the other natures of Christ and and what he expresses in the same way um you know not not my will but thine be done or um recognizing the the biblical truth of compatibilism in human uh freedom and God's sovereignty it's like everything is read through a lens of of a hard determinism that seems to try to indicate or, or imply that God causes all things um, as a primary means. And so you read the scripture in a way that is radically, utterly, completely different than any reformed believer ever reads the scripture. And it's not because they read it inconsistent. It's because you you do. You're, you're, you're reading it with a misunderstanding of what the doctrines of grace are and teach. Um, and Okay, I'm going to pause you right there. So what I did was we read this and my husband said to me, huh, I wonder how determinists reconcile that. And so then I said, oh, 
well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. And I came up with a few options, but then I said, I'm not sure. Let me ask a Calvinist. And I came to you. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not but, sure. But one thing is it what, has nothing no, to do with on, Calvinism. Brian. I'm not sure what the accusation is for. If I know that there are determinists out there who say God determined all, and then I see the son pleading with the father, I think, I wonder how a determinist would read that book. I don't read my scripture looking to go after you. I, I had a question about this, but I don't appreciate the accusation that I don't know how to read my Bible. I had a question. So now what I just learned is next time I'm going to go to not you. <laughs> I'll ask another Calvinist. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the spirit yeah, of yeah, Chris has possessed this whole room. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, uh, uh, again, again, the point is, um, the, the point is, so, so many of these things, uh, when fa Father forgive them, for, for they know not what they do. What, what, what in there has any relation whatsoever to determinism? Like, what, the, what remotely has anything whatsoever to do with the topic of determinism? Yeah, so at this point, I really don't want to engage with you further, Brian, because I think what you've done is you've put the ball in my lap as without being able to answer my question, you're putting it on it as though my question shows I'm inherently a flawed Christian. And actually, Rob Johnson answered this question by saying that most people would consider this a textual variant and therefore would not put any kind of um, heavy major doctrine on it. And I find that to be a much more satisfying answer. So I, I thank you for your time. I, I don't think yeah. I want to engage on it further. Okay, well, that's fine. I, I had actually put in Discord that, I saw that there was a textual okay. variant. Yeah, and that, that's why I was interested to hear your side, but you're not giving yeah. me an answer. You're telling me that I don't know how to read my Bible. So, that well, I, I, so, so, so here's your answer. Your answer is, if God's determined plan and purpose is to grant Israel a time of repentance and forbearance for 40 years, wherein he saves a remnant to himself in Christ in the new covenant to fulfill Jeremiah 31, that the new covenant be made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and that God's purpose is to save those who, according to the election of grace, right, in Romans, that are, are that believing remnant, then Jesus praying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, is 100% consistent with God's purpose in the new covenant, his purpose to save an elect remnant to himself. And it shows the furthering of that purpose. That's, that's, that's all that's being communicated. But you certainly don't have to answer, but, but, but there is your answer. If I may. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Sean. Your feedback is okay. awful. I, well, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't do nothing about that. I'm going to be right. Um, but Isaiah 53, 12, the very last line says, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. so, and we are seeing a partial fulfillment of what is going on in Luke, where he says, Father, forgive them, or they know not what they do. Why? Because we've got people today who still deny the existence of Jesus Christ, who still uh, will say that the, there was no historical Jesus, such as uh, people who consider themselves comedic, and or hotel and or hotel uh and i see that i've heard that yet in contrast the muslims don't deny the existence of jesus christ but they deny the there is very deity father forgive them for they know not what they do why because you have the comedic Muslims, Jews, who are actually receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ by faith, which we all of us have to do by faith. The Bible says Abraham believed God and was counted for righteousness. 
So it is by faith. We read Hebrews 11. All of that says by faith. Um, so it is by faith, not by anything else. Yeah. So you are forgiven and receive everything. Your salvation you receive by faith. Amen. Hey, Nate, uh, well, can I... I well, I, I think Josh um, actually raised his hand. I think, did you want to get on this conversation too, Josh? Or was that for something else? Oh, I, just only to say, um, it's always surprising to me to hear, um, you know, someone like Steph, who, who's, you know, fairly educated uh, in, in these matters, I think both formally and informally, to be charged with, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know what seems to be like an overt ignorance or laziness or something. So, Steph, I'm really, I'm really sorry. I thought that was really uncalled for and out of place. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate you. Thanks for your so time, we, there, Josh. Uh, Nate, can I can I read one scripture? Sure. And to be yeah. fair, it's it's been a day. It's been a day on here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So to 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 understand what's going on with Father, forgive them. Um, the the context is is exactly what Paul is communicating in Romans 11. When Paul says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. Why, why would he ask, has God rejected his people? Because of their rejection and their crucifixion of the Messiah, um, because of the, uh, the closing of this old covenant. He says, has God rejected his people? By no means. And then he says, for I myself, I'm an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. That foreknowledge there isn't simply prescience. It's it's covenantal, intimate. He says, um, do you not know the scripture, what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They've demolished your altars, and I alone and left and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel, national ethnic Israel, failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it but the rest were hardened. And so this is the fulfillment of Father, forgive them. This is God not completely and utterly casting away Israel and is exactly within the new covenant what is going on and what's being communicated. Though it's true that Muslims and everybody else come to Christ by faith, I, I don't believe that's the, the immediate purview of Christ in, in Luke um, 23. Hey, hey, morning, everybody. Hello? Man, is my thing broken? It's Hello? That, no, good, good morning. Canadian sorry, I was, I, was, again. I, was, I was trying to feed my cat. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure. I, thought, I figured my, my atheist headset had cut out again. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I wanted to come in. I've been listening for a few minutes, and the first thing I want to say is, yeah, come on, Steph, how dumb are you? Of course, I'm kidding. Um, I, I'm kind of, Josh came in a, a, just a minute or so before and stole my thunder. Um, not that Steph needs to be right. white knighted for, and not, <laughs> no, it's good, man. Not to be, Steph that needs to be white knighted for in any way, shape, or form. Um, like, as Josh said, certainly uh, super smart, certainly smarter than I am. And one of the most, um, charitable people I've run into on, on this app. Um, and, and to hear her kind of damn near castigated um, is, is, uh, is, is frustrating to say the least. There, there have been a, a, a few Calvinists that I've, that I've spoken with um, that aren't the way that it seems that, that some on the stage now are. But um, it, it's, it, it's always... I don't know whether it's more freshening or frustrating to hear one Christian tell another Christian, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Um, and, and then just to continue to drone on after she says, I don't want to talk to you anymore. 
but continue to, to, to roll out this, this, this horse and beat it. The horse is dead. There's not any blood left in the horse's body. Just let it go already. Anyway, I'm in a mood this well, morning. Well, well, to be, Hey, everyone is to be fair. I mean, I think Brian's, uh, you know, pro- probably one of the most mild mannered, like easy spoken guys. Um, so if, if that got your hackles up, man, you should have been here yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look. Here, here's the thing. When when, when I speak, I, I, if if Steph doesn't want to talk, perfectly fine for Steph. She can sit there quiet all day long. It doesn't matter to me. But there are certainly questions about the text that we can continue to look at and explore and explain whether she wants to respond or not. So I appreciate the comment, Michael. But um, you know, when when I'm on stage and speaking, I'm not speaking just for the benefit of the individual that I might be talking to, but for those who are listening who might be interested in the topic and, and to unpack it a little bit. And I, um, I certainly, look, I, I appreciate Steph um, tr- tremendously. Uh, I, I stand by my statement that I do think that so many of these folks, they read the scripture with these goggles on in a way that is not consistent with the way a Calvinist reads it. And if that's deeply offensive, then, then I, I apologize. Um, has nothing to do with the with the hyperbolic, you just don't know how to read scripture kind of nonsense that I'm hearing people say that I'm saying. That's that's not what I'm saying at all. But I but I am saying that in relation to the doctrines of grace, when I hear the objections that are often raised or the way scriptures are in, are interpreted, um, it, it absolutely shows a level of that's not the way a, a reformed person would ever approach that scripture. And so it makes me and others scratch our heads. But so Brian, if, if, that's, if that's not good enough for you, I, I just don't know what to tell you. If the, and I understand what you're saying there. But then if someone who has a question comes to you, <laughs> the correct answer is probably not, boy, you Steph, just don't Steph, know how to Steph, we don't have to engage. It's fine. Well, you you no, said Brian, you didn't want to talk you, about you it. You just said that you did want to. So here's the thing, Brian. My original question for in the Discord for everybody who's not caught up was, Basically, how do determinists, and I did say Calvinists, how do Calvinists or any determinist understand where one member of the Godhead is pleading with another to change something? That was my question. Now, I want to understand how determinists would look at it, because in my tradition, the answer is, if the son is pleading with the father to change something, the father can change something without sacrificing his omniscience because determinism isn't true, right? So I am perfectly settled on this issue. So I think, hmm, who has an opposing opinion to me who could give me a really well-rounded, educated answer? I know, I picked two Calvinists, you and one other, to ask this question to, right? But you're the one who said, you're not giving me an answer about why one member of the Godhead would plead with another to change. You're telling me that I only read my bible to refute calvinism which no, is that's, that's not what i said Can that's, I play that's, that's not advocate remotely what i said but go ahead yeah i'd like to play calvinist advocate um could this be because jesus was you know a human at this time so how would that be any different than when we pray so if we believe non-reformed people that you know prayer moves the heart of god like maybe in real time perhaps a reformed person would say well that's true prayer moves the heart of god or something but it's already been done. So like God already knows everything. It's already been determined, but that doesn't mean people don't say prayers. God just already knows what they're going to pray for. And you know, it's already done. So Jesus is perhaps just praying in accordance with what God already knows is going to happen anyway. Maybe it was for the benefit of, I don't know, someone else or us reading the book or us reading the story about it. All right. Yes. That's all I got. I have no but that was Real quick. That was Brian's initial answer was that it was for our benefit. And then no, my no, no. I said the scripture well, records it for a benefit. Yes. Okay. Sure. Not, yes. not that he said it, but anyway, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So then my follow-up question to both what you said and what Nate said would be, then if God wanted us to understand a determinist, his determinist nature, why would he set that situation up and make it like, why would one member of the Godhead be pit against another? And the follow-up question, that question was met with, I'm not reading the Bible right. So that's, Nate, what you said is kind of already what was given, but my follow-up question. Wow, well, Steph, I don't even want to engage with you anymore. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if, if I could, uh, because I feel like we're at least 
my point and Michael's point really didn't have anything to do with the content itself. Um, you know, I, I find these theological discussions interesting, uh, particularly from the standpoint of one's beginning with an interpretive framework and moving from there, right? And so, uh, like, that's interesting. But, uh, I, I mean, I think both of us came in the room, heard a friend of ours, uh, you know, being what we interpreted as, however you want to couch that as hyperbolic, um, you know, the way that that came across to us was an attacking, uh, inappropriate way to approach, uh, you know, what she was saying. And it, it's, it's interesting to me that your response to this sort of faux apology uh, uh, and, and to say, you know, you're, you're here for the audience and, you know, so, it's, but, but that wasn't really the content was, you know, unimportant, honestly, to me and to Michael, it was, um, you know, how it is that you decided to present that. And I just feel like that's the point that's being missed here. Yeah. So to your question there, Nate, um, about could, could it be that? Uh, I think it's important to recognize that Jesus isn't trying to change the father's plan. He's not, he's not trying, it's not, there, there is no example in Luke 23 of one member of the Godhead trying to alter or change or anything, the plan of the father. Um, and I think, I think that's, I think that's, that's what's missing. When, when I said that it's for our benefit, that's exactly what we're saying. Christ is actually revealing the, the Father's plan. He's actually revealing the grace of the Father toward Israel in this, rather than trying to change his plan. It's not like, it's not like the Father was just going to wipe Israel off the map, but it's a good thing that Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, so he didn't, right? That's, that's not the idea of what's going on in Luke 23. Um, but rather, we see that in the face of Israel, rejecting and murdering the Messiah that was sent to them, him coming to his own and his own not receiving him, and the Father being perfectly justified after they have crucified, or I'm sorry, after they have um, stoned and rejected and murdered the prophets that had been sent to them for centuries, the Father would have been completely justified in now immediately judging Israel. And yet the Father's mercy and grace and purpose of grace in Christ for Israel is seen and reflected in the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They, they know their heart, their plan, their motives, but they don't know what you're doing. And then he fulfills that, and we see that in Romans 11. So uh, it, it's 100% perfectly consistent with a deterministic understanding, but being consistent with doesn't mean that it's trying to reveal that. And, and Steph mentioned that three times now about um, God revealing that he's somehow deterministic as if that's um, either, either his motive or whatever. That's, that's, that's not what's going on. But what, but what is going on is perfectly consistent with understanding God's eternal purpose to save a people to himself. But wait, you, you just said that it is God revealing a determined plan. Yeah, God, God revealing his grace and mercy toward Israel. Yeah, absolutely. And yes, it, 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 is, uh, uh, it is determined. But the Christ saying this wasn't for the purpose of saying, see, look, God predestines everything. That's, that's, not, that's not what's going on there. There, there, there are places in the scripture that very clearly God is revealing that he accomplishes his will in the host of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand, and he accomplishes his plan and his purpose. And there, there are passages that speak in these broad, sweeping terms about God's kingly uh, rule over all of creation to accomplish his will. But Luke 23, that's that's not the purpose of it. I, the, the purpose is to say God is a God of grace, and he is gracious toward Israel, though they rejected him. God is saving a remnant according to the election of grace, according to his purpose. Kumbaya. 
Uh, Josh, I thought you, there was something you oh. said. Someone said, ask Steph in chat or something. Or did you not have something to ask Steph? Or was that covered already somehow? What? Well, I don't know if that was me. Um, oh, I thought I thought Jesse said something like you said I something about Steph, chat, and then you I couldn't get my. Sorry. Oh well. Anyways, um, yeah. Too bad you guys joined late. I'm I'm about to have to run. Steph, I'm not even gonna ask. Not even gonna do it. Should I do it? Should I ask? <laughs> I can't stay. No. I'm here for <laughs> you, brother. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I mean the end. The end must be coming soon because, like, they're, they're, yeah, ev everyone is just like up in arms over everything. Even me. Maybe I got a little testy earlier, but uh, I don't know. I like to. I like to think it was justified. All right. Well, <laughs> uh, Michael, Josh, quit your jobs and join us sooner. Um, it was good to see you. Good to hear from you guys and Brian and Todd and everyone else. Sean, Steph. See you guys all later. Have an awesome day. Take care. Bye. <laughs>